We'll give it a minute. Okay, I'll let Simona sit down. Okay, so we have, uh, I'm Greg Melcher, the uh, Chief Operations Officer for the New Generation Warfare Center. Uh, very glad to be here and happy to cha channel the uh, last opportunity for everyone. Uh, I can tell that we have the real diehards and committed people left here and I uh, want to invite everybody to take advantage of the last chance to ask a question so maybe you can think about it. Um, and of course, uh, we have an excellent set of panelists. Uh, let me introduce to first the concept of the panel, and then I'll give you their back, a little, little bit on their backgrounds, and then we'll give them each a chance to talk. Uh, so this is Battlefields of the Future, to adapt and innovate in the context of new generation warfare, a political military perspective. So sort of three concepts for this panel is to focus on how do we estimate the changed European security environment after the war in Ukraine, and what might be the impact of new technology on future battlefields, given what we've just seen? Uh, what are your lessons learned from Ukraine so far? And what should NATO learn from Russian actions in Ukraine? And finally, new challenges require new approaches. How will NATO counter the multi-level hybrid threats? So I'll introduce the, uh, the panelists, and uh, I'll go in the order they are in the program here. Uh, first, we have uh, Major General uh, John Meade. He was commissioned in the Royal Artillery and served in a range of operational assignments in that area. His staff employments include joint planning roles in the UK's Joint Forces HQ and HQ ISAF Joint Command, as well as three postings to Army Headquarters in the Strategy and Personnel Directorates. He commanded the 1st Artillery Brigade and was the Chief of Staff Allied Rapid Reaction Corps before assuming his current appointment as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans, Joint Force Command in Naples. He has seen operational service in Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan, where he deployed five times and recently led NATO's task force to evacuate NATO Afghan employees on Operation Allied Solace. And I apologize to you all, but I, I took your backgrounds and tried to put it into about a paragraph, so I might get, I've gotten something a little wrong. Okay, so joining us by a video message, not live, will be uh, Mr. Paul Lorenko. He's a career diplomat since 1995 and has held positions at the Portuguese embassies in Luanda, London, Sarajevo, and Belgrade. He served as an advisor to the Minister of State and Foreign Affairs and as a diplomatic counselor to the Minister of National Defense, and later he was the Council General in Sao Paulo. He served as Chief of Staff of the Minister of National Defense and has been the Portuguese, Portuguese National Defense Policy Director since February 2020. So as I said, we'll have a video from him, but he won't actually be live. Then we have Mr. Aleske Donlayuk. Uh, he has uh, served as the special advisor to the head of Ukraine's Foreign Intelligence Service as an advisor to Ukraine's Minister of Defense. He currently heads the Center for Defense Reforms and is a coordinator of the NATO-Ukraine Intergovernmental Platform for Early Detection and Countering of Hybrid Threats. Next, we have uh, Major General uh, uh, Yulian Berdilla. He's the, he's the chief of the Romanian Land Forces Staff. During his service, he fulfilled several joint and multinational staff assignments as the Chiefs of Staff in the 2nd Infantry, the G5 for Land, uh, Land Force Component Command, and NATO Integration Planner for the Romanian Land Forces. His operational experiences include deployments in Multinational Force Iraq as a Coalition Operations Planner and in ISAF Afghanistan as Battalion Commander. His previous command assignments included Commander of Headquarters Multinational Division Southeast, Head of Strategic Planning Directorate, and commander of the 81st Mechanized Brigade and 2nd Infantry Brigade. And uh, last, but of course not least, uh, we're, we're honored to have uh, Major General Pierre Joseph Guiver, Director of Command, Doctrine, and Education Center, Land Forces France. And sir, you have an, uh, quite an impressive resume. It took me a while to figure out how to boil it down. Uh, you've been in so many places. Uh, he has trained for and served multiple times in the 27th Mountain Inter Infantry Brigade, including its command. He has deployed in French Guiana, twice in operations in Bosnia, served in Afghanistan as a military assistant to the International Security Assistance Force Commander and to Iraq as, French's, as France's uh, component commander. 
Staff positions include speechwriter for the Chief of the General Staff, Chief of Staff to the Military Governor of Paris, General Secretary to the Land Forces Command, and as an advisor into the Military Strategy Pros Prospective Innovation and Digital Transformation Cell at the Joint Headquarters. Most recently, he served at the uh, MINUSMA Force Chief of Staff in Mali, and he's now head of the Doctrine Director of the Army based in Par uh, the French Army based in Paris. Okay, so that's our team. I think we've got a great panel up here. And so we'll just go down in order, uh, starting with uh, General Meade, and give them each uh, uh, roughly eight to 10 minutes to have their comments, and then we'll have a time for a few questions at the end. Yeah, General. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my, my, my three challenges are it's Saturday night, it's panel 13, uh, and I've, I've been asked to talk about NATO uh, innovation, which is something we're not always accused of in, in the command structure. And we heard um, on the last panel about uh, the, the President Macron challenge, which I think was the brain dead challenge, which ended up being actually, I think, quite a useful stimulus and challenge for, uh, for NATO. Um, and I will just explain, I think, how I think that has changed, because I think the, the previous panel also, and through much of the course of the last two days, has, has highlighted just how the alliance has strengthened. It's taken a crisis to do it, um, but as we look to the future, we, we should really do need to learn uh, some of those lessons. So I, I'm, I've got a few pictures, because it is late on a Saturday night, um, and no British presentation, British in NATO presentation, uh, on the future would be complete without a picture of a thousand-year-old church. But I, I, I do this for, for some effect because that's Salisbury Cathedral, it's 2018, it's just after the, the, the Scripple uh, poisoning. Uh, and who'd have thought? You know, who, who'd have thought? Um, 2014, uh, the invasion of Crimea and then uh, very quickly after that, the Donbass. Who'd have thought? Uh, war in Europe um, now, as we speak, uh, and the bloody confrontation in Europe commencing on the 24th of February, uh, who'd have thought? So my, my point is here about the significance of a future-looking alliance, one that doesn't just rely on the adage of we're a defensive alliance, but is much bolder in terms of preventing that. Uh, the Peter Drucker quote about um, you can't predict the future, but you can create it. And I think that's exactly what the Alliance is seeking to do with its new military strategy, with even as we align over the deterrence and defense of the Atlantic area, and that's by no means aligned, I'm charged with much of that for, for NATO South and East, we're already looking at, we've got a new strategic concept, and we're already looking to 2030. I, I think that's a much bolder and more positive way of looking at the future. I also think we are going to have to spend more time analysis, on analysis of some of those strategic trends. Uh, so that's currently charged quite heavily with Allied Command transformation. I, I just don't think that's good enough. We need to be more networked. It's everyone's business uh, to be involved in change. Uh, again, the, you know, the, uh, the Eric Shinzeki quote about if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance uh, much less. So my first assertion is about the significance of future-looking and forward-looking alliance. I think that is really happening, but there are some significant choices in that, and our approach um, matters a great deal. Our boldness of approach matters a great deal. Uh, my second point, really, and it's the next slide. It's another, Peter, if I, if, oh, I've got that, actually, I've got this clicker. Oh, no, we've gone on too far. There we go. Thank you. Um, it's another Peter Drucker quote about uh, culture. And it's, it's easy to sprinkle a bit of culture on, onto any discussion, but I think it matters a great deal uh, for, the, for the outlook uh, of the alliance, because we're, we're not just 30, soon to be 32, and somehow lowest common denominator, we deconflict, occasionally integrate. We're much better than that, and I think we're showing we're much better than that, and we need to be much better than that. Now, the, the kind of tangen tangential aspect of this is this is Allied Rapid Reaction Corps command team. You've got Lorenzo Daddario there now, who's the Corps commander in RDC Italy, uh, and, a, and a fine group of multinational officers that are all over the alliance now, quite literally. Carlos Salgado, COS, uh, NATO mission in Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we used to pride ourselves on our strategic or our, our advantage as a headquarters and where we sought to have uh, to be the best was through innovation and through constant experimentation. Um, and again, I don't think it's something we do enough of yet in the Alliance because somehow 
innovation was done by Allied Command transformation and you know the, the command structure and the force structure, we, you know, we just deliver readiness and we just good, get good at our procedures. We need to do that, but it's just not good enough in today's world because of the rate of change, particularly in some of the domains which I'll, which I'll touch on. Uh, I think, you know, I think we're also pretty resilient, but, but I, I think this culture aspect and the way that it's everyone's business to be involved in change uh, for the Alliance uh, is, is deeply significant. There are some challenges to that, uh, but I actually think the multinational environment is an invigorating one, I, you know, much more so than when I go back to the UK and work for the British Army. I think that the, 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 the diversity of ideas, the, the kind of working environment, uh, the one that I now find myself in Naples, where we're constantly running operations in Iraq and Balkans, and we've heard much of, about the Balkans over the coming days and some of the challenges we've got coming up in, in the coming months, um, is an incredible culture to, by which to, to look at transformation and change, and we're going to have to to keep up. Um, so that's really my, my second point about culture, and it does need you know, positive interventions to actually deliver that cultural change. I think that is happening, but more yet needed. Uh, and my final point is really, um, and I'll see if I get this right this time, is about this, this whole thing, because you can easily sprinkle again multi-domain operations uh, onto any conversation and people nod. Um, but it is deeply significant in terms of the ways that we deliver competitive advantage. And we want asymmetric advantage. We want to be NATO that delivers strength v weaknesses. We've got so much such strength in terms of our values, in terms of our combined military might. But there's a lot we need to do to bring multi-domain operations to life and really design it into the way that we operate. First of all, we've got to be better at joint. So joint doesn't just happen. The air land seam, the maritime air seam, they, these, these really, really are significant. There's a picture there of um, uh, the George, not, not the George W. Bush, that's coming in um, relatively soon. That's HST, that's, that's the Harry Truman. And the way that NATO took command of those carrier groups and was, has been operating aircraft from the Adriatic up through to the Baltics has been an incredible lesson. It's been enabled through these crisis response measures and through the will of the Alliance and nations like Romania to deconflict airspace, to take some of the pain that that has involved, to, to enable movement across borders. And my word, there's some, some tough lessons there. But those seems really matter. So we must double down on joint, but also catch up with space uh, and cyber. And, it, and I don't think they're particular strengths of the alliance because we, we over-interpret uh, defensive cyber, whereas it's such a contested and competitive zone that I think there is some, there's some absolute policy aspects of that that we need to look to, as well as getting better at this, the SCEPFA thing, the sovereign uh, cyber effects provided by, um, voluntarily by, by the alliance. And space is becoming so pervasive, not, not just in, and we're seeing that um, in Ukraine now, and we're seeing it in terms of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, uh, to name but a couple of uh, vignettes. And the final thing I'd just say about um, the, the, the approach is we've got to push hard on interoperability. It's been a pretty harsh lesson, actually, since February the 24th, about where we are not interoperable. Um, and, you, you know, we've got to make sure that we design force packages that optimise for military capability, not for political effects. So sometimes 21 nations in a brigade, headquarters in a brigade is not the answer, maybe fewer nations. I think some of the framework um, setups that are happening in, in Romania and Bulgaria, you know, may, they provide a pretty good model. The, the other aspect I just mentioned, um, it, it, just to finish with now, is an aspect of multi-domain operations, and that is uh, the real need to get after uh, joint fires uh, as, a, as, a, as a priority for the Alliance. I think we've, we've viewed fires, and by that I mean artillery, but also air-launched uh, munitions, uh, munitions launched, uh, long-range fires from, from the maritime domain, which is ever more capable as well. But the integration of that uh, is something that we need to play catch up with. We've got some, I'm preaching to the converted, I know, with General Hodges here, 
and the work he did on dynamic front and, and some of the land fires interoperability. But we shouldn't feel comfortable about any, any sensor, any shooter, because we're nowhere near that yet, uh, and we need to get far better than that. And, and the lessons that are ongoing now, every single day, the high Mars deployments, the artillery war that's been raging in Donbass, some of the effectiveness of Ukraine targeting et al, uh, are ones that we need to study you know, profoundly. I'd also say uh, urban operations, urbanization is, is a kind of profound driver that we need to study ever more closely when you look at some of those urban conflicts and where people seek to hide, conceal, um, and fight from, and just the kind of indiscriminate use of force and fires that, that Russia uh, has been employing. Fortunately, I think the Alliance is starting to look at this very hard. The, um, the ACT, so Allied Command Transformation, is running. We're running a war game with them in January about multi-domain operations and urban operations. But these things we, we, should, we shouldn't sit comfortably on. You know, there, this conflict is raging. The risks of miscalculation and mistakes uh, still remain. Um, and these are areas of change uh, and the future battlefield that are proliferating and I I I this whole aspect of um, uh, novel technologies and future technologies, well, they they're coming pretty quickly. So uh, that's really my pitch uh, about the necessity for a bolder view of the future, um, that I'm confident that we're there, but we're not accelerating hard enough, that our culture has transformed in terms of relationships, the way that we deal with each other, our ability to take risk, our, our kind of reduction in bureaucracy in the alliance over the last year has been a wonderful thing, but more yet. And let's not feel in any way complacent when we look over what is happening uh, in, in Ukraine. And finally, we've really got to design in multi-domain operations and tan make tangible delivery of that, including, uh, and in particular, joint fires. That's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. I appreciate your insightful comments and, uh, on uh, what is going on from the perspective of the Joint Task Force in Naples. Uh, next, we're going to uh, hear by a video by, from Mr. Paulo Lorenco. Dear Excellencies, colleagues, uh, distinguished participants, uh, let me start by thanking the Ministry of uh, National Defense of Romania for the invitation to participate in this conference. I'm very sorry I was not able to be there in person. I am comforted, though, by the fact that I am recording this message here in Romania, in Bucharest, as uh, I speak, where I've just had a very substantial round of talks with my Romanian counterpart, General Yanku. Let me start, first of all, with a disclaimer. I'm hardly an expert in these issues, so I'll ask you to be lenient uh, with me as I go. The members of this panel have been tasked with debating the battlefields of the future with an emphasis on adaptation and innovation in the context of the new generation warfare. And I would focus my intervention precisely on this point. The analytical focus on warfare as a generational sequence made popular some four decades ago, albeit artificial and not bereft of problems, has proven relevant to systematize history and make sense of conflicts around us. In fact, analysis of conflicts from 9-11 to Afghanistan, from Iraq to terrorist attacks in Europe, from Russia's attack on Georgia to the invasion of Crimea, and more recently the war in Ukraine, have benefited from this approach. However, Russia embraced and adapted the concept of new generation warfare beyond this older debate to reflect the complex nature of its own hostile disposition. An important element to understand this concept and its complexity is Russia's underlying vision of Ukraine and other former Soviet states as a part of itself that was momentarily separated following the fall of the Soviet Union, but that must be put back together again against all uh, odds. It's about bringing to fruition Russia's vision concerning its own identity, sense of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Varying interpretations about what new generation warfare means must not distract us 
from the issue at hand, namely its increased complexity, interconnectedness and systemic impact. While I could spend the time allotted to me speaking about the importance of EDTs and dual-use technologies, in which most countries, uh, Portugal included, have been significantly investing of late, or about the importance of interoperability, especially in the EU-Atlantic context, the blurriness and increased complexity of Russia's new generation warfare leads me to focus my address precisely on its cross-cutting and systemic nature. Traditional, traditional wartime methods include military action following a declaration of war, involving mostly combat operations on traditional domains, land, air and sea, in attempts to defeat an enemy's manpower and firepower in order to take or retake control of certain areas. However, Russia's military action under its new generation warfare approach of course, occurs also and primarily during peacetime, targets both military and civilian infrastructure and uses all means available, including asymmetric and indirect methods, some of which in permanence and covertly. In fact, Firepower is only one of the many tools employed. Others include political and economic pressure, psychological warfare, intimidation, bribery, as well as the dissemination of disinformation and propaganda. Even the idea of legality has been weaponized, uh, such as in the case of Russia's perpetrated legalization of the occupation of Crimea. Russia's disinformation campaigns target not only Ukrainian citizens and their government, the international community at large, but also Russian citizens and Russian-speaking people outside of Russia. There is a decisive preference for influence, ideological and psychological, over physical destruction, although both can occur and have simultaneously. There is also a preference for fostering the enemy's domestic deterioration and for attrition as we are currently witnessing in Ukraine. In addition, traditional military forces are largely replaced or reinforced with the action of special forces that act outside traditional channels such as the Wagner Group, currently deployed in Ukraine but also in the Balkans, in the Mediterranean or indeed in Africa where it seeks to undermine the West's efforts and credibility, thus fostering greater instability. Which is why I, I believe uh, time has come to, make, to take this matter seriously uh, in our hands and to set up a strategy to deal with the threats of non-state actors. Portugal will be contributing to this reflection. Now, Globalization has resulted in the widespread diffusion and democratization of access to information, technology and finance, but also um, access to new domains, which has enabled these non-state actors to proliferate, disperse and to become more mobile and more successful in their disruptive goals, especially when they are backed up by states, even with plausible deniability. Simultaneously, the notion of security is becoming broader and more encompassing, covering borders, critical infrastructure, critical supplies, ivory threats, terrorism, cyber and outer space, among others. This means that security and defense are seen as no longer just physical, but also ideological, deeply associated to the protection of core values core principles such as democracy, the rule of law or human rights. It also means that defense is no longer a strictly military affair. As such, the battlefields of the future do not just concern traditional military domains, they also encompass new domains like space where global trade and communication as well as military operations are growing exponentially and play a vital role or cyberspace whose ubiquitous nature constitutes the ideal ground for crime and political contestation 
as well as cyber attacks targeting political, military, research and development or intelligence actors. The battlefields of the future no longer only concern the expected hot spots on the map, nor conventional warfare, they are everywhere and broadening with the securitization of new areas. Perhaps this realization is part of the adaptation and innovation we need. From the undermining of Western society's very foundations to the melting of Arctic ice sheets, which despite bringing new opportunities for global trade and resource exploration, also bring severe risks for climate change and the fight over scarce resources and sovereignty. New technologies, suitable and adaptable structures and equipment are important, even vital, to ensure security and resilience, but they are only a part of the equation. There is no doubt that states must prepare with IN technologies and military capabilities, but they must do so together with non-military tools and new strategies to deal with old and emerging threats and with actors like Russia waging its new warfare. In truth, after 24 February, Russia became a 360 degrees antagonist and strategic spoiler from the Black Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, wherever our interests lie, using the full spectrum of its available tools, we must develop an appropriate and broad response, be it under NATO, the European Union, or in our overseas missions and operations. Ultimately, adaptation and innovation mean that our collective defense must be able to deal with new threats without losing its ability to tackle older ones. In order to do that, we need a multi-layered, whole of society approach, one that is fit for purpose, the protection of our principles, of our interests, of our own and of our partners' resilience. A tall order, of course, but we must be ambitious. A famous Romanian quote sums it up much better than I could ever do. It says, the greatest danger is not that our aim is too high and that we miss it, but rather that it is too low and we reach it. I wish the panel and the conference a very rich and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, a very nice uh, comprehensive presentation. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to ask him any questions. Uh, so next I'll turn to uh, Mr. Donaluk, and uh, if you could offer your, your views. Uh, thank you for having me here, and uh, I, I think it's a great opportunity to explain the current situation from Ukrainian point of view, which is, I, I think, a uh, little bit different, you know, because of uh, the current situation in, in my country. Uh, so I think that uh, we would agree that uh, uh, the Russian invasion into Ukraine is not just Ukrainian problem or actually kind of regional war, right? So it's a global challenge. And uh, I, I think that uh, it's pretty clear that uh, it's not kind of, uh, you know, the final stage of uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, which Russia started in 2014 from uh, annexation of Crimea and invasion in Donbass, but rather something completely uh, different, and it's rather the beginning of something much, much bigger than that. Uh, I think that it was uh, clear that synchronization of uh, Russian and Chinese activities was not some sort of, uh, uh, you know, coincidence. And obviously looking to uh, Russian attempts to build uh, some kind of coalition of uh, similar-minded authoritarian leaders, uh, not only with China and Iran and North Korea, which is actually especially disturbing for us right now, but also with uh, some countries uh, NATO used to consider as old friends, right? Actually, uh, very close friends very, very often. So all of that, from my point of view, it's a signal that the, the humankind is on the edge right now of the potential uh, global conflict, and that's why all of us, uh, not just Ukrainians, are interested in uh, 
kind of very uh, clear, uh, united respond to what uh, actually we have in Ukraine right now, because uh, Russia should be punished not only because of uh, the threat to Ukraine. Russia should be punished because we have to show to the rest of the world, to that, you know, revisionists who are looking for the ability to change the international order uh, developed after the Second World War, we should show them that uh, the Western civilization, that uh, the most uh, progressive and de democratic forces of the world, they have that red lines, and that red lines shouldn't be crossed by anybody. And in such case, I'm pretty sure that uh, even countries like China uh, would change the uh, vision of how they can uh, position themselves on the global stage. So uh, because of that importance uh, of the situation in, in Ukraine and uh, the importance of punishment of Russian Federation and Putin's regime, of course, uh, I think that we should consider that war in Ukraine as our you know, common war. And we should think about the victory in this war as a uh, tool for preventing uh, global conflict. And uh, that's why I think it's, it's very important to uh, discuss how that victory uh, should look like and how to get that victory. Because again, right now we, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be very critical, but I, even in Ukraine, we don't see that, you know, or at least we don't speak very loud and clear about how to define that victory and how to reach. So it's completely clear that uh, Russia is a big uh, uh, military power, despite, you know, uh, it failed in the first stage of the invasion. It's not because of Russian weakness, it's because Ukraine, uh, despite of our economic troubles for more than eight years invested significant part of uh, our income into development of Ukrainian armed forces, which are definitely one of the most capable uh, in the world right now, even comparing to some very honorable old nations of NATO. And it's not just only about Ukrainian brave soldiers, it's also about number and quality of uh, Ukrainian uh, systems. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, Russia is a serious military threat. Russia still, despite of all of the sanctions, uh, has uh, a lot of uh, sources uh, for income to support the war, and uh, Russia is nuclear power. So it means that uh, it wouldn't be possible for Ukraine, even hypothetically, to force Putin to sign the peace in Moscow, right? So we are limited to the territory of Ukraine, including Crimea, because Crimea is Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, we understand that uh, right now, maybe not the huge majority of Russians, but a lot of them support uh, this war. And uh, to some extent, uh, that support Putin got from the invasion into Ukraine was his personal uh, political reason to start this war. Uh, and it's another, you know, very important dimension because uh, we need not only to win this war, we need to uh, force Russians or convince Russians to accept they defeat in Ukraine and they have to uh, make Russians to accept that they should change their attitude not only to Ukraine but to international order. So we need Russia to start being normal neighbor. Because with current Russia, there is no way we can live uh, peacefully, coexist peacefully. This is not the country we want to uh, leave uh, our, uh, to our kids as their neighbor, right? Because it's just kind of postponed big conflict anyhow. So we need Russia to respect not only Ukrainian borders, but Georgian borders, Estonian borders, borders of Moldova, and other things, right? So this is the final goal. And uh, in this regard, we have to say that to reach that uh, uh, goal, we need to think about, uh, from my point of view, three key tasks. So task number one, it's uh, military defeat of Russia. It's very important because, again, we need to undermine significantly Russian military capabilities, not only for 
aggressive actions and uh, offensive operations, but also uh, for uh, defense of already occupied territories. And, and in this regard, it means that military goal uh, for Ukrainian armed forces right now, it's not just pushing Russians, you know, because again, so even if we will liberate all of the territory of Ukraine, it doesn't mean that Russian, Russia will accept the uh, defeat, right? So we need to make that unacceptable damage to Russian military capabilities, and for that we need to get uh, uh, your support, because completely clear, Ukraine doesn't have any other rear but NATO. Only that Rammstein coalition, this is our rear. And in this regard, we have to say that uh, what is the most important for NATO right now to win this war? It's to develop as soon as possible your industrial base, because we have to be honest that since 1991, uh, the degradation of that industrial base, even in the biggest provider of the international security and security for NATO in the United States of America, is unacceptable. It's terrible situation, and right now, with that level of consumption of uh, even like such simple things like artillery shells, it's very pity that all of the NATO combined, you know, is not uh, ready to support uh, Ukraine with proper number of that simple, simple stuff. So industrial base, it's key issue, and again, I think that it's also very important to explain to population of your countries that this is not kind of, uh, you know, charity or donation. Actually, this is your war, and uh, you are interested in winning it, because otherwise you will have not economic crisis, but military crisis on your territory. Uh, second point, actually Russia has economic and financial opportunities to continue this war. And again, uh, we can discuss, you know, efficiency of sanctions, uh, but we have to say that there are a lot of countries, including already mentioned Iran and North Korea, who actually managed to live with sanctions, right? And again, so it's probably bad for average uh, citizens of Russia, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, they in Kremlin, they don't care about that people, right? So they will have enough resources to continue this fight. So it requires completely different approach to, uh, I would say not sanctions, but non-military means against Russia. Because again, Russia is not in kinetic confrontation with NATO, but Russia is definitely in hybrid confrontation with NATO. It, it uses a lot of non-military means to undermine, to destabilize your societies, to uh, create chaos inside of uh, your governments, etc. So technically, because uh, the Western countries started using sanctions against Russia, you are in that hybrid confrontation with Russia as well. So it's better just to recognize that and to think how to make that process more efficient and to think about consequences and results of that non-military means. And again, not only sanctions, but other forms of non-violent uh, uh, influence on Russian strategic interests. Uh, and it requires uh, serious cooperation of intelligence agencies because this is their role. They should uh, define that strategic interest of Russia and important people of Russia because it could be completely different interests and to find proper way how to, uh, how to make damage to that interest. And the third dimension, uh, completely clear that right now not only uh, population of Russia that significant part, but also groups of influence and uh, Kremlin uh, itself, the inner circle of Putin, Shegu, Patrushev, uh, they have like no intent to finish this war. So we have to think about appropriate human domain operation to influence uh, social groups in Russia, general population, uh, oligarchs, military uh, personnel, etc., to change their attitude toward this aggression and to prepare them to acceptance of, uh, of their defeat in Ukraine and to prepare the stage for transforming Russia in something normal, uh, suitable for the rest of the world. And again, I think that especially because 
we have that kind of demand not only in Russia but in some other countries for that uh, revisionism. I think that we are interested in that altogether. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. I especially appreciate the, the concept that uh, we in the West may not want to think we're at war today, but they are at war with us, whether we like it or not, and we need to start acting appropriately, at least in a hybrid sense. Okay, next we have uh, uh, General Badilla, the Chief of Land Forces of Rony. Thank you, Greg. Now, before we start, uh, I would like to, uh, I can ask you to help a show of hands, how many of us think Ukraine can win, if you can raise your hand. Higher, higher, I can see you back here. Okay, that's good. And give a round of applause for our Ukrainian friend because I think he deserves it. Now, when, when I signed up for uh, our good friend George Skutaru to participate in the conference, I think I was the first one to confirm. I don't know how I ended up in the last panel, but well, I'll have a side discussion with him. Um, important panel, important panel about the future, important panel about the, uh, the relevancy of the land power that I represent, and I think others here uh, stay with me. But I think we need to start a little bit with what's out in the field there and how well we adapted for, um, and I see Mrs. Simona Kojakara here, uh, we've been talking for the last five or six years, what's the coherence of the forward presence, and then what's the participation inside the alliance of this deterrence and defense plan? So if I can ask, uh, they have uh, the short clip that I, we, um, my colleagues presented, please.
Thank you. I wanted to start like this because any discussion about the future needs to know or to recognize the contribution of so many men and women that are out there in, in training to, uh, to partner for mission, not just for, uh, for the exercise. And you saw different flags, you saw different exercises, but the main factor that you saw in there is the, is the soldier. And I think for us, for the land power, any discussion about the future needs to start about what is the, what is the soldier of the future and how, how, does the, um, how do we leaders of today empower that um, major capability that I think we all have. Um, two or three things about future and the future of the soldier. I think to, uh, to a certain point, and I represent more than 35,000 um, soldiers in the Romanian land forces. So that's, that's a number. That's something that you can express um, their objectives, their training, their resources, their interests in the profession. Uh, but like I said, I think there, there are two variables, there are two or three variables that we leaders need to pay attention to. One, the candidate changed. So the candidate to the profession of arms has a representation of the society where he or she comes from. And I think we need to pay attention to that. We need to make sure we provide the resources for this profession to, to, uh, to ensure effectiveness. And I think that's an important factor. And that means not just the salary. I, I hear this a lot, that it's the, it's the dividend and it's the uh, uh, social benefit. No, it's what are the values, what are the core values, especially for Romanian soldier today and in the immediate future with an operational environment in the proximity like the one in Ukraine. Um, number two is what's, what's the professional development? And I, I want to stress that because you need to have a career path. You need to have incentives for this uh, uh, candidate to stay in the armed forces and, like I said, um, uh, educate, train, and provide that confidence of the capabilities that, that uh, the soldier can actually carry out the mission. And it's sometimes challenging because the dynamics inside the society in Romania, um, I'm proud to say that Romania has a very dynamic uh, labor force, uh, just to exemplify, the IT community. Well, the IT community, I can tell you, steals a lot of our communication information system experts, being enlisted NCOs or, or young leaders. And you have to compete with that in a very objective sense, and you have to promote the, the, um, uh, this preservation of the competencies inside the land forces. Uh, last but not least is how do you produce generals of today? Because this is, this is, a, this is again, a, a, an operational strategic level of representation, but you need strategic leaders. And going back to uh, what you said, uh, I think that's one of the vulnerabilities of Russia. It wants to promote a doctrine that is very fast and very uh, sharp, but it does not have the strategic leadership to implement it. And that's a critical factor, and I'm glad to see here uh, General Hodges, uh, and oh, by the way, parenthesis, I, I always paid attention to General Hodges when he presented uh, so many cases, uh, very good lessons identified, and from his experience, he guided us. But today I saw a little bit of emotion when he saw back there the exercises and the soldiers, and I'm glad that I produced that nostalgia inside of General Hodges again, because that's an important relationship. Uh, uh, between the strategic leaders. How do you network uh, within the alliance community, within the region? How do you network general officers and how do you produce that network of leaders to, to be able to wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning and say, okay, we're ready to go? Um, and, and I think that's, um, that's one objective that, that we all have. Now, a little bit about the force, uh, my second point. Let's realize where, where we, the land forces, came maybe four or five, six years ago, uh, what kind of operational environment we came out from? Well, it, it's a decade or more, 15, 20 years of Iraq and Afghanistan and the contribution to stability operations that Romanian Armed Forces uh, provided to allies and partners. That, in consequence, generated a um, uh, pool of capabilities and, and especially generations of, of units that were designed 
to, to uh, equip, train, and, and fight in a very uh, specific doctrine. And we all knew and heard about the counterinsurgency the, against the building support operation. So we had to shift back from that and to re-enter a classic um, foundation of the doctrine, uh, if you can call it that, uh, looks more conventional, more of the offensive, defensive, uh, and other support operations. Uh, and that means a special shift inside the doctrine. Uh, number two was um, COVID. And I can tell you, again, because of the land forces and because of the density and distribution of uh, land forces units inside the national territory, COVID uh, had, I think, very effective support 24-7. Um, and, and I was proud to visit some of the soldiers in the initial mounts of the pandemic, months of the um, pandemic, when, when everything was hasty and everything, uh, we had no, what we call the standing operating procedures. But the soldiers being trained, um, and especially junior leaders to, to approach um, different villages and cities, I think we, we pretty much provided that support. Interagency layer at that point was also important. So here comes four or five years, like I said, um, four or five years ago when we started to see a critical, critical um, and toxic strategy from Russia being gradually elevated. Um, again, I recall working with, with Mrs. Kozhikaro and some of the uh, planning assumptions for the for the first strategic defense review, and we we had to recognize and define because the term is nice hybrid warfare. Well, what does it mean for for the uh, uh, political military planners, and how do we approach that? And here it comes five six years later, uh, some of those assumptions were actually confirmed as facts. So we had to again go from Iraq Afghanistan pass through the COVID and then approach the, the, the more recent and more toxic developments in the operational environment. Um, number three, and, and my last point, uh, I want to I recognize this, this private uh, public partnership and especially with the representation of New Strategy Center and New Generation Warfare, uh, Greg Melcher here, because initially uh, three or four years ago, we started to develop these pilot tabletop exercises to war game operational situations and how do we respond, first of all, inside the armed forces and then outside with interagency apparatus to, uh, to different uh, types of scenarios. And that, that, is, that is crucial for how you train your operational layer of the, of the command and control structure and especially the force structure. Uh, it gives the planners the visibility to, to some scenarios uh, it allows agencies to work to some to some solutions, but also prepares the mind for um, for some for some special set of actions uh, inside what we call the the new culture uh, for security, which which is a big term. But once you get to the to the to the force level, you need to make sure you have the competencies developed. And and again, recognizing those workshops, uh, late nights, where we produced uh, and designed not a solution, but an environment where you can actually start to prepare mentally and organizationally to, uh, uh, to different scenarios, like some of them we, we can see uh, today in Ukraine. And I can, I can underline probably two or three findings that I think were important. Um, we still called it, at that time, airland battle. But it was a new dimension of the airline battle because now you have the UAVs. Uh, you have at attack aviation or multi-role aviation of, of the helicopters. And then you have this combination of anti-armor and armor that I think remain the same. Today, as we can, as we can see in, uh, in Ukraine, this, this, uh, this dual opposition of anti-armor and armor, uh, especially on on the success and, 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 and praise of the Ukrainian forces, the anti-armor density of your capability set or your force structure, I think, is, is probably irrelevant. And we need to import that into the doctrine, and I can assure you we do it. Um, Short-range air defense. Again, one constant that in time developed in different technological advancements, but in the field, in the doctrine, is probably the same. Uh, UAVs critical, but UAVs with the different spectrum of the ISR fight, 
that we used to call it, so the forward fight. Um, a package for target acquisition, let's connect that to the long range fires. If you don't have target acquisition, your, your long range fires cannot prioritize. And prioritization of targets, especially with the density of the battlefield um, in, in, in Ukraine, that's, that's, you have to have it. So, so this apparatus of the ISR fight, target acquisition, and long range fire is critical. Command and control. And, and we're starting to see that. Uh, remember first discussions in Naples we had with Joint Force Command in Naples with some of the planners was uh, land-based command and control versus space-based. So how do you shift from that being a land power leader today? Very expensive. I can tell you that the network of a, of a space-based command and control is much more expensive but much more agile to, to, uh, to respond to that command and control effectiveness. Um, I'll stop here. I'm very much looking forward to your questions or uh, at least a farewell and a goodbye at the end because I realize the last panel. Uh, and I'm, I'll be very glad to, to hear from, uh, from my, my French colleague here uh, for the closure of the panel. Thank you so much. General, please. Okay. Thank you, General. And thank you. Um, good evening to you all. <laughs> the last to speak. Uh, I don't know, I have 10 minutes? No more? 5, 10, 10? Uh -huh. okay. I will have to rush, but like, uh, I think it's a case for, for some phases of the battle. We have to rush, but also to be uh, um, um, resilient. Um, well, um, thank you for your invitation, and thank you for the video um, showing up um, the French contribution, but also for our allies uh, within the NATO uh, reinforcement of uh, the security of um, uh, Romania and eastern flank of NATO um, in this uh, so sensitive uh, and critical situation for our uh, uh, friends of Ukraine. Um, I will just try in a few minutes to provide you some insights um, from the land forces perspective um, depicting what we, we think will be our operational environment and what it is now and some way ahead of our developments for the land forces. First of all, uh, we are clearly now in an integral warfare environment, and that has very uh, many um, consequences. What, what is it? Uh, previously, we, 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 had, uh, we used to um, describe um, the phases of uh, developing towards the war between um, peace, crisis, war. Now we have changed our analysis uh, framework. This is more, this is now competition contestation, confrontation, and that, and that implies many, many changes in our mindset, but also in our organization. We have to be eye readiness in any case. Um, and and just, I've just forgotten in my introduction word, something very important. All what I will tell you is based on our observation, of course, of what um, is going on in Ukraine, but not only. We have observed, and we are observing very closely what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh, what um, is happening since um, a few decades uh, between Israel and Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, what happens in Yemen, um, what has happened also in Tigray, and of course in Africa, where, where, where France is um, in front, in the, uh, on the front line, um, not only with terrorist groups, but also with Russia. Um, yes, and in total warfare, that, that means that it's all domain, by design, by essence, any time. And when I tell that, that is very important. All domain, at the strategic level, no problem. Okay, it's obvious. At the operational level, almost. At the tactical level, absolutely not. And I, we think that now uh, we have to take into account all the domains at the tactical level and not waiting for the strategic level to devolute some capabilities and saying, okay, okay, you will use cyber at the tactical level, for example. And of course, integral warfare means um, being able to, uh, to conduct uh, horizontal escalation. And for the French, uh, I have um, an example in Africa. Um, we have seen Wagner uh, confronting us uh, in uh, Central Republic of Africa and in Mali. This is clearly horizontal escalation. They were not the terrorists, but we had the terrorists, we had Wagner, we had influential warfare, and many pressure of many of kind of uh, actors, from conventional to terrorist, to civilians used um, as puppets by, uh, by some um, powers, and so on. And this is really 
And the consequence is that now our pre-deployed forces must be ready uh, in any conditions uh, to fight back or to, to monitor all these actors who are um, combining um, um, by design, by plan, or um, as a, another combination. This is the first point. Um, the second point is that um, the context is social warfare. Um, um, previously, we, we discussed about war amongst the population. It was a motto in the French army. It was uh, for um, during asymmetric operations. Um, and now we consider it now it's war for the people and for the population. It's a little bit different. We have to preserve our center of gravity, our public opinion, um, but also to make sure that um, the people uh, where we, we, we operate, um, they're um, part of the operation and not opposed to us. Um, and that is, um, and why it is so, so sensitive now? Because of social media. Because every, everybody is, um, is a media. All the citizens, and even in Africa, if we go to Africa, everybody has a smartphone and, 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 and can communicate and inform everybody. And then, therefore, you have to be fully aware um, of this uh, potential threat or potential uh, opportunity. Um, and the last point about social warfare is that to be aware, and we have discussed it, or I will not develop, about resilience, about cohesion, um, about endurance also. We, we, we speak a lot about resilience, but not, not only endurance and, and, uh, and uh, what, we, what we speak in France, uh, force morale. And we are developing a special program to enhance our force morale, especially within the, uh, the army. We um, could develop later on. Um, next point is digital warfare. And this is a very important point. And our uh, Ukrainian colleagues, for me, are, are very um, interesting in that point. And now I will say uh, that every, um, every citizen is a digital soldier, including in our own country. When I speak digital soldier, uh, through information, but also to hack or, or to take information, data on, on the web that the military have, have not seized or have not observed, noticed. And every soldier, this is my opinion, it is discussed within the French army now, every soldier is a digital combatant. Well, um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's open in, in France, but uh, well, I've developed the theory that we provide an assault rifle to each of our soldiers, and now we are considering that information warfare is at the level of, uh, the, at the strategic level, every citizen is doing uh, information. We must trust them. Therefore, we must provide um, two, uh, an additional uh, uh, weaponry to each soldier, that is a terminal. I don't know which kind. We are developing one in the Scorpion project, that is contact. But I think that we should have hardened um, smartphones to any of the soldiers with all the apps and all the communication at any time and not waiting for 10 years to have the smartphone as you have the last uh, in, in now and, and the, the next one, next generation will be in just two months. Um, Next point is um, warfare could be long and long-standing. And the consequence, everything has been um, organized in just in time in France, just in time for economic reasons. It's a liberal approach of the military. It cannot go ahead with such approach. We need stocks, we need um, mass, we need um, uh, um, industries able to, uh, to maintain their chain of production. And um, well, this is a, a big, big issue because it's, not, it was absolutely not until COVID, uh, somebody mentioned, or sir, you mentioned it, uh, it was absolutely not uh, the idea, e even in France, to have um, a public policy more, more, more um, to strengthen and to uh, change uh, the way we, we deal with the industry, especially and with the stocks of ammunition. And mass remain critical. Um, and you know that um, um, a former dictator of uh, Russia said that mass is also equality. Uh, I think so not only high-tech. Um, next point is firepower uh, versus maneuverist approach. Well, I am from the light uh, units, then I, I, I clearly uh, believe in maneuverist approach. I have no problem with that mission command. Every, I would speak about subsidiarity and mission command. Absolutely no problem. But in some phases of INTC warfare, you absolutely need firepower. And you, you, have to, you can be maneuverist. You can have the best special forces. Well, facing uh, the, the, the amount of artillery of the Russians in static positions. It's like First World War, unfortunately. 
and we have to wait to, yeah. And then therefore, if you cannot uh, um, uh, offset uh, the firepower with the same firepower, definitely you can be the most cunning and creative. It will be difficult to, um, to um, outsmart uh, the enemy. Um, subsidiarity, I mentioned it, it's a culture of uh, mission command. We, we clearly uh, believe in it and we, we will enforce it. And in the, in the area of the digital warfare, that is absolutely critical. And we have to trust all our soldiers as we have to trust our, our uh, civil society. And the Ukrainians show us that they, they back you. And, 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 and even foreigners can back you in, um, in a very uh, in a non-military mode, um, in a very uh, dynamic mode. And then we, we have to, to seize it and consider it as an opportunity. But for the French, and, and uh, as we, we don't have the, the heavy firepower, some other um, powers have, uh, definitely subsidiarity and mission command is a way um, to offset and to uh, at least seize all the opportunities and um, to compensate sometimes uh, heavy firepower. Yeah, the last. Okay. Uh, okay, MDO. Uh, Mich um, we, we have spoken about MDO, multi-domain operations. Um, I think that challenge is not joint for I I I city and for the French perspective. This is to reinforce, harden each components and to being autonomous. Then the firepower, you don't have to rely on, on the heavy air force but to rely on your own uh, guns, uh, ATACOMs, uh, IMARS, for example. And uh, because uh, once the, the start, um, when, when the war starts, uh, you cannot ask for, hey, the Air Force, could you could provide me uh, additional assets? They will battle, they will wage their own battle facing their own peer-to-peer um, -peer adversary uh, for gaining uh, air superiority. And then you will have to rely on your own. And therefore, uh, I think the biggest challenge and when the one we must invest for the French is how you suppress enemy fires. I could develop it, it's very important, it's not our not only own challenge, but frankly speaking, in what I observe in the conflict I, I, told, uh, um, I mentioned, is that it's a big challenge of receiving so many shells, ballistic missiles, um, drones uh, firing you everywhere and uh, in, in, at the tactical level, not at the operational and strategic level. And at last, for the French, um, we, we never forget for us that we are also committed not only in Eastern Europe, that is a key issue, but in Middle East, where we have strategic partnership, in Africa, where the situation is worsening, where we face uh, so many uh, terrorist groups, and most of them manipulated by some powers, and the same that is acting, uh, for example, in Ukraine, but not only. Uh, and of course, that we have, for the land forces perspective, also to defend our overseas territories. In that sense, we must keep, maintain a balance a force between expeditionary capabilities and more uh, heavier forces. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, General. Appreciate the, uh, seeing the elements of how the French take on the challenges of new generation warfare. Unfortunately, our time is at the end. I'll just make a concluding comment that uh, clearly new generation warfare has multiple elements of hybrid all the way through conventional warfare. Uh, and as you can see, it's going to take individual countries working together, together with joint leadership, combined coalitions, interoperable to be effective. But to solve the challenge today, including all the elements in the generation warfare, we're going to have to rely on total society, society resilience as well. And only when that all comes together, we'll be able to counter this threat. Uh, so with that, I'm going to have to bring the, the panel to a close and thank each of you gentlemen for your, for your comments and input and uh, maybe an email to our friend from Portugal. Uh, if I can ask you to stay seated, well, maybe just a hand for our presentation. And if you, could, if you could stay seated for one second, if we can invite the rector of the college to please come up and offer some concluding remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everybody. As I said at the beginning, uh, we are very honored to have you here this, uh, these days. And um, I think that uh, it was uh, 
a very, very, very dynamic uh, dis uh, discussions during these days. And uh, George, I think that uh, you have, to, you should change the name in uh, Balkan Sea and Balkan, uh, Black Sea and Balkans Security Forum in action, because uh, the, 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 the discussion were very, very, very dyna dynamics. And uh, because uh, we are in the end of the, the forum, I want to thank you again. And um, I want to invite you, because we are in the, in the campus, in the university, and because, because we are in the end of the panel marathon, uh, I invite you to feel free and feel uh, students for a couple of hours and uh, please enjoy a um, Romanian uh, uh, evening and uh, all our uh, buses are waiting for you and uh, I invite you in our uh, terrace from our, uh, for our campus to, to talk a little bit in, uh, in another atmosphere, let's say. Thank you very much once again, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you on behalf of the New Strategy Center for these two very intensive days in which you had 106 speakers from 22 countries in which we debated the security challenges facing the Black Sea region and the Balkans, but also the world of Europe. We had a real platform for debates, discussion, and assessments, and for a better understanding of a strategic context. I thank all the participants, our moderators, speakers, and express my gratitude to our partners, with whom we organized this fantastic event, the University of Agronomic Sciences, to Rector Razvan Teodorescu. I also want to thank our institutional partners, the Minister of National Defense. Thank you very much. We're Madam Deputy Minister, for your constantly support to our work, and dear generals, uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to NATO uh, Public Diplomacy Division, and of course to the Ministry of Education. This event will uh, not have been possible without the support of our commercial partners, all the companies that have been with us and supported us financially. Many thanks to my fellow volunteers from the University of Agronomic Sciences for their admirable effort, the technical team and the translators. In particular, I want to express my deep gratitude for the extraordinary work of the new, strat new strat <coughs> strategy center team, hard work over several months to organize this extensive event, Izel, Anna, Maria, and other colleagues who got involved and did such a great job. Thank you very much. All of you, we deserve. Next year, next year, we'll see you again at the seventh edition of the Black Sea and Balkan Security Forum. I want to meet you again and see the Russian's aggression has been stopped, that Russia has been forced to withdraw, that we, who believe in freedom and democracy, have stood together united and help Ukraine with all our determination. And most of all, I would like to see a free and independent Ukraine. Slava Ukraine. Thank you very much. See you next year at the seventh edition of the Black Sea and Balkan Security Forum.